Hello and welcome to another episode of the Saints FC podcast. Um, I am very, very excited. Not only do I have Tom sat to my right, but I have uh, Mr. Duncan Alexander from Opta uh, sat, sat next to me as well. Duncan, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me on. And uh, Tom, yeah. Uh, welcome, Dong. It's good to have uh, it's good to have another another face on the podcast. Yeah. Um, for those of you who like watching our episodes on YouTube, you'll notice we're in slightly different uh, environs. We're in our South London studio uh, today, um, enjoying you know the, the the sights of New Cross, the palatial uh, sights of New Cross. Yeah. Um, as always, if you do want to get in contact with the podcast, uh, you can email us saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter um, at saintsfcpodcast. Um, one thing I do want to plug um, this week is an evening with Matthew Letizia. Uh This is happening next week in Southampton at Revolution. You can still get tickets. You can go and have dinner with Matt Letiz and hear him telling stories of, of wonderful times in the red and white stripes. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be there. I would love to be there. Uh, I've been to that sort of thing for he's really good value. I strongly recommend it. Um, there, there we go. I'm going to get onto one email. Um, so Simon Hill, uh, Simon from Wareham has emailed in. Uh, says, really enjoy the podcast. Listen every week without fail. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and he goes on to why this season has been so negative. So I think the main reason uh, the season has been so negative is due to the end of last season. After going the last six home games without scoring under Puel, the whole fan base, base was still negative mood going into this season. Obviously, Puel isn't to blame for this season, but as fans were unhappy after we narrowly managed only one win from the first four Premier League games, it left everyone wondering what the hell was going on with us, especially after three brilliant seasons with Koeman and Pochettino. In a way, as fans, we were spoiled during that period. The way it looks now, uh, we've gone horrendously downhill. It's an absolute disaster. And although we've gone tremendously back backwards, we have a squad that could easily finish in the top 10, meaning that the management is clearly to blame. Well, I think we'll get onto that later in this, this episode. Yeah, I think there's been some action taken. Yeah. Um, a lot of the players um, we have now finished sixth two years ago under Kumin. If we can finish this season strongly, stay up, get to Wembley and keep our players in the summer, we can go into next season with a new manager and positive vibes for the new era. Uh, Simon, I do hope we can stay up. I hope we can win the FA Cup. Um, and I think you're, you're right about Pellegrino. Um, do we want to deal with it? Do, do we want to get the defeat against Newcastle out of the way and then just yeah. get, get straight into the, the, the Pellegrino after that? We'll probably talk less about the defeat against Newcastle than we've talked about any other game in the history of the podcast, really. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much awful from about 70 seconds in. I feel sorry for the fans that went. I'm amazed that the club didn't, after the game, immediately come out and just give the fans the money back. Like, I just don't understand that. But yeah, it was, a, it was by all accounts, a terrible performance. No redeeming qualities whatsoever um and again you just got a feel for the fans that traveled up on a saturday to go and watch that yeah and um pellegrino came out after the match saying that he basically felt the players had, had given up um and i think frank lampard was on match today saying you know when your manager comes out and says that yeah if your manager says news. that it's not good <laughs> yeah it's almost he's, he's asking to be sacked isn't he? he's basically saying i can't motivate this group of individuals to to, to play for me yeah so, yeah, what, what, they had no choice. Well, and, and he got his wish, didn't he, Pellegrino? <laughs> if that's what he was, he was angling for. Um, Tom, it, it, let, let's start with you. What, what did you feel like when you heard the news? Well, you, you text me is how I, I found out, uh, like all momentous news. Um, I felt glad in one way, but also I, I've, I felt like, why didn't they do this after the Spurs game at Christmas when... when what I didn't really understand was that the Newcastle game taught Southampton fans absolutely nothing that we didn't already know. Uh, if you look at everything we did wrong in terms of a, a toothless attack, uh, we had like 70% of the ball, which we didn't utilize in any way whatsoever. Um, the same rigid formation and, and methodology for playing a game of football. I, I, I'm almost puzzled. It's like, what, what, what was the, I'd love to know, like, you know, Les and, and Ralph, if you ever listen, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Because um, you didn't see anything new there. This was just, it was just a degree worse than what we'd seen before. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the performance was as bad as the one at home to Leicester. I mean, Duncan, coming from the perspective of not being a Saints fan, mm. what have you made of Pellegrino and Saints this season? Were, were you surprised we stuck with him for so long? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, sacking a manager in March is a fairly rare occurrence. I mean, the only one recently that's that's worked out, I guess, is when is it Poirier left Sunderland and and they kind of just about stayed up. One of the <laughs> you know, innumerable seasons where they just scrape through. But um, it just seems, yeah, like Thomas said, you could have done it a few months ago and given yourself perhaps a better chance, but who's to say really? I mean, we're, we're in a kind of weird season where there's been this kind of ethos the last few years where the, there's a certain group of managers who have got built up this reputation of like always been able to keep teams up. So you had Pulis, who's never gone down. Allardyce always keeps team up, teams up. Um you know, Pardew will go into a club and, and boost everyone. Yeah. And it's it's almost, the edifice is crumbling now because Allardyce seems pretty negative at Everton and they're not too happy. And Pardew is clearly not working out at West Brom. So, you know, it, it could work, it might not, but you probably would have gone, or it might have gone down anyway. So, uh, I think with Pellegrino still at the helm, I just can't see how, how we could have survived. I think know? once the players have given, you know, once we're, we're in a kind of era where players can make it quite obvious when they've sort of given up. I mean, we've seen it with Chelsea a couple of times recently. And, uh, you know, even Arsenal at, at Brighton the day really looked like they were in that position. So it was bizarre that they then went and won at the San Siro. So, um, um, yeah, so, but yeah, we'll see what happens. And I think as well with, with Saints, uh, uh, what's the worst that can happen? You know, they, they twist now. They get someone in, they get relegated. I think, you know, we, I think we're odds on to get relegated anyway. So, you know, why not? We've, we've said it so many times before. Why not go down fighting at least? Yeah. At least give it a try, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know, Duncan, if you've got any thoughts on this, but one of our, um, listeners emails in quite regularly with, with stats around Southampton. He, he likes pointing out the fact that we've had 13 draws. So he thinks maybe we're fine margins away from, yeah. from being successful. Um, I don't think he was like a huge fan of Pellegrino, but he was able to kind of offer some evidence in his defence. Yeah, I mean, I've got into trouble this week just by stating facts in the league table. I've still been harassed by Arsenal fans, but um, (laughs) you've actually only lost two games more than Arsenal this season. So it is, you know, it is a lot of draws. Um, And yeah, that is technically fine mind. And I think, you know, this season for me as an outsider looking in, it feels like a kind of... um, kind of the end result of a few trends that have been building up at Southampton over the last couple of seasons. And, you know, it's not like you've got bad players. It's not like even like you're not creating good chances. It's just for whatever reason, be too rigid or the, or just a lack of form or confidence from the strikers. It's, it's really, you know, impacted. Do you, sorry, just to ask, I mean, obviously you, you watch a lot of football and you, you know, infinitely more than I, you know, certainly I do. Do you think now that Premier League football, the, um, there are people who are exceptionally so much better than other players. Um, and then everyone else is kind of on a similar level. And it's, it's kind of, it's such fine margins now that, mm. you know, that, you, you know, there are players that stand apart, but, uh, sorry, my front door's just gone, but obviously, um, you know, is it, is it about the fine margins? I think absolutely. We're seeing, <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I'll go and get the front door. Aggressive <laughs> knock. Whoever it is. So uh, after that uh, rude uh, interruption, it's my so neighbour, yeah, got a parcel for your neighbours next door. I mean, this this is one of the issues that we've had in the New Cross uh, studio that we've haven't had in Hackney so far. <laughs> oh, we we get the occasional sign in have Hackney. The, they don't have post North London. Uh, <laughs> um, Tom, do you want to ask your question again to, yeah, to I, Duncan? I was, I was on this season. You you mentioned about Southampton squad and and how we have got a talented squad. But do you do you feel that now um, world beaters aside, like De Bruyne, that that Generally, the, the standard the, the standard is that there's not much in it now between players. No, absolutely. I, mean, I think this season more than any other in the Premier League history, we're seeing you know there's, there obviously is a massively standout team who are probably going to set a number of new records. Um, and then there's the the big clubs who obviously got a lot of resource and and are going to win most of their games. And then pretty much from sort of Burnley down, it's pretty even. You know, are Burnley that much better than Southampton or, or better at all? Not really. It's just, it really is kind of a series of, I mean, every week you look at the fixes and it's all, oh, that's a, that's a six pointer. It's just a series of kind of, you know, pretty even clashes. I, I wonder if we can uh, jump around with kind of the order that I, I said we'd, we'd tackle the questions, Duncan, but um, one of the things which has fascinated me this season has been XG kind of mm. coming into the, to the, I still I, don't I the, still the cultural zeitgeist. But one of, you know, mentioning Burnley, 
is what what made me think of that. And lots of people have been saying, oh, the new Southampton manager, we, we should go and try and get Sean Dyche. I mean, whether he'd once come or not, I don't know. But if you look at the XG stats, Burnley are massively, massively outperforming. Their keeper makes more saves mm. than you'd expect them to, and their strikers finish more of the chances than, than you'd yeah. expect them to. Yeah, you take De Gea out of it, who's clearly miles better than anyone else. Tom Pope has been the most uh, kind of overperforming goalkeeper in the Premier League. I mean, I think he's actually quite good. I think he's, uh, he probably should be in England's World Cup squad, although I don't think he will be, but I think he, he's earned it. Um, and you're right, Burnley hardly create any chances. Um, and yeah, they keep. Well, they were, particularly in the autumn, picking yeah. up wins. Um, you could replay the season 10, 11 times and Burnley would probably finish 15th, 17th, 14th. So I don't think necessarily Sean Dyche is a massively better manager than some of the other managers in the Premier League, but he has hit on a pretty good system. And they do defend in quite a unique way, Burnley. And, you know, they, um, they allow teams possession outside the box unusually yeah. um, but they are particularly adept at a blocking shot so you know it's kind of it, it's one of those things where it, it works for them it might that should go to another club and it might not work so that's yeah. the gamble when clubs change managers really yeah I, I think we've seen that when um, Eddie Howe went to Burnley you know mm. what, what works brilliantly for him at Bournemouth just didn't work at Burnley and, and now he's back at Bournemouth and I think you know you look at Bournemouth and could they have anyone better than Eddie Howe for, yeah, for I actually, I I think that players and managers have certain places where it works for them, and and, and other places where it doesn't. You know, I, th- I think Cooman was so well suited to Southampton, and yeah, you know, well, possibly then, you know, and maybe Letitia was was right never to move on because yeah. maybe he could have moved to I don't know Chelsea or Aston Villa or someone, and in that era, and just faded from view. You know, it's it's yeah, rare that a player would do that. Pop 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 quiz answer, couldn't he? Mm. You know, and I think you're right. I think maybe we've spoken a number of times about this. There is a, a, always an urge in football to rush on and do the next thing. And, you know, we've spoken a number of times about the young players that have left Southampton, people like Callum Chambers, that maybe even not Oxley Chamberlain, who's, you know, they had years in the wasteland. Maybe they would have been a bit better by staying just a year or two longer. Mm. Um, should we get back, back to Pellegrino? Yes. What, what do you think is the reason why he didn't work at Southampton? Because... I've seen a few people kind of digging up stories from when he was first appointed. We were promised attacking football. We were told about a manager that was so passionate that he once dislocated his shoulder, swinging his arm around on the touchline. Um, Just suggest weak shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, well, we just totally missold Pellegrino so that when he did show up at Southampton and he was this very cautious tactical manager, it was only ever going to play one up front. There was a very slow build-up play. Um, and we've been promised kind of exciting attacking football after the Puel season kind of run its course at the end of the season and, and not worked out. Oh, I, I, I think he... Um, I think what you saw was the probably the difference A, between the Spanish League and the English League, where... Um, I think the, maybe the, the scrutiny and the pressure of the Premier League. And I think we, we spoke a number of times about this where, where Pellegrino, you know, had a very good top, top career as a player. But when it came to a manager, he seemed just to freeze. Like he seemed to be paralyzed by the situation in front of him. And I, one of the early games this season I went to was Burnley at home. And you could see that it was nil nil. But you could see that as Burnley got in the ascendancy and, and we could do this a number of games this season, Palace at home is another one that springs to mind. He just kind of froze and he, he, he wasn't able to make decisive decisions that change games. And, and I wonder if it was the pressure that got to him, the pressure of the Premier League. And, you know, and I think we saw with the, I think that people just underestimate the Premier League maybe. And I think with Wolves at home, he, he underestimated it and we lost. Yeah. Mm. I think the pressure is a really good point to make because you come into you know the self-styled and true richest league in the world biggest league in the world and everyone who manages in the Premier League knows that dropping out of the Premier League is not the thing to do you know you can rele- get relegated from some leagues and, and bounce back but it's such a financial issue to go down so every manager down there knows that staying up is massively you know important clearly um and it i think it just sort of manifested itself in a lot of cautious play you know you look at some of the i've got some numbers here i mean some of the like manolo gabardini last season was averaging 3.6 shots for 90 which isn't amazing but which is sort of what you'd expect from mm. a forward this season it's down to uh to 1.8 
you know, it's basically half. half yeah. You know, and, his, and the XG quality of that has gone down from like 0.16, which is reasonable, to 0.10. So, you know, again, he's not just having fewer shots, but the ones he's having are of a lot less quality, which would imply that, you know, the positions he's getting in or the positions that he's been played into are much worse. And and it's that kind of negativity that I think every Southampton fan's probably noticed and, you know, it's manifested in the numbers. Yeah, I, I think kind of Puel, he, even he was quite negative, but you look at last season and, you know, we scored two, three legitimate goals against Man United in the EFL Cup final, obviously one of them disallowed. We put four past Watford. Um, we beat Sunderland, was it 4-0? Or yeah, 4-0 at their place, yeah. Um, you know, all of that happened in a short period of time. And But the players knew how to attack quickly and link up. And, and even though maybe Puel was more defensive-minded than most Saints fans have wanted, the attack was still able to create chances. And Pellegrino seems to have taken the team a little bit backwards in terms of the defensive prowess I, I don't feel like we're as solid although maybe we have conceded fewer goals I, I'm not sure but you know going forward even though the kind of xg table suggests that maybe we should be better off and the, the strikers have been a little bit wasteful when I've been going to the games and watching it when we're behind, I just cannot see us scoring. We don't seem to be creating the chances that, that will create goals. I, I don't think teams, uh, I think, every, and another thing I think maybe that took um, Pellegrino by surprise is the quality almost of every team in the Premier League. Um, now, I think with the with the money that, that they have and the, and the players being as they are, you know, you expect Brighton to come into the Premier League with Glenn Murray leading the line. And that's almost like a, it's like a, answer to a joke isn't it but it's not you know Glenn Murray scored like 12 13 goals this season let's talk about him going to Russia why the hell not but yeah. yeah but like well, why the hell not you know and, and Hewton has, has managed that team and he has extracted every single bit of quality out of those players but it goes back to what you said about how all the email actually mm-hmm. that uh, you know the hangover from last season it, yeah. football is very much a kind of momentum game in a lot of ways you know and Brighton yeah, they don't have the best squad and they struggled to kind of add a proper attacker in the summer, but they had that momentum, they had that kind of system that got them up and, and were able to kind of push down. You wonder how much Southampton last season under Puel were kind of carrying on the sort of Koeman. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's very easy for clubs to kind of get into a kind of negative spiral and I think, you know, it would probably means that the, the decision to get rid of Pellegrino was a, was a good one. Yeah. I don't think you'll find many listeners disagreeing with you on that one. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm sure I had some point about, oh yeah, so, I mean, this, this is one of the things that I wanted to think about, kind of looking back at Premier League uh, managers and particularly Southampton's managers and, you know, the relatively similar squad that Koeman had to the one that we've got today, which managed to get to sixth. Uh, and I think the quality of a manager is when, you know, when, when you look at the players that we have, under Koeman, yeah, I think Shane Long nearly got, you know, he, he was in double figures. Double figures, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was on fire when yeah. um, Pella dropped out of the team, he was on fire. Yeah, and, and you look at players like that, when they have their best season under a particular manager, you know, that, that tells you that that manager's doing something good. When a, a big group of players have their best season under that mm. manager, I mean, that tells you that, that the manager's really special. And I remember kind of uh, Saints leading the line with Lalana Lambert, um, and Rodriguez the and the Trinity, three of yeah. them that's in the run up to the last World Cup and those three players that, that was that was the best they've ever been in, in terms of what I've seen um, and you look at Gordon Strachan Southampton side and he got you know incredible amount out of players that just were were nothing really anywhere else you know yeah I mean like players like Brett or like we who we love Brett Olmrod and he was great on the podcast but you know they he brought them up to another level yeah um, and, and I don't think you could say that there's a single player in that Southampton squad that has looked better under Pellegrino than any other Southampton manager. Well, the, the weird thing, that, and one of the things that is damning really against Pellegrino is that he is probably the first Southampton manager in a number of years to inherit a squad at the start of the season that's arguably better than the one that was the, than, the, than the previous manager did. Um, you know, yes... You know, he lost Rodriguez, but we still have Charlie Austin. We still had Shane Long. Like they're not going to win in the Champions League, but they're decent Premier League strikers. And he had a better team um, than anyone else. You know, the addition of Lamina, the addition of Hoyt. And he still couldn't get it. And, and to your point about players that have gone backwards, if you look at someone like Nathan Redmond, who looks totally devoid of confidence. And I know he is Marmite. He, he divides the fans. But 
you know, last season he was pretty effective for Saints. He mm-hmm. was no Mane, but he was pretty effective. This season, like he's looked a ghost of his former self, mm. and he looks like. I mean, I, the games I've been at, he looked like he'd rather be anywhere than on a football pitch. Yeah, and I think this is having you know been on the periphery of of club stuff where you know they kind of apply data to things. I mean, I think I'm always really wary now of criticizing players for form or or for bad performances because often they are sticking precisely to the script that they've been told to. Um, we did a thing in the summer with Danny Murphy, and he told a good story about um, he was playing for Fulham against Blackburn and Phil Jones was in Blackburn. And basically, the whole game, every time Jones got the ball, he was just smashing it straight away. And Murphy, as the kind of like elder statesman, came up to him in the second half and said, Phil, you're a, you're a good player. You know, Just get the ball down, look around, see what you can do. And he said, I can't if I do that. And the, the manager, who was Sam Allardyce, um, is just going to bring me off straight away. So, uh, you know, players are often just doing what they're told. You know, they're just yeah. cogs in a machine. Well, you see that when you're at games, don't you? And you hear fans screaming, like, attack, like, you know, like, beat, like, take him on, like, hit mm. the line. And, and they don't. And, and, you know, you imagine if you're like a Nathan Redmond, like, you've been doing it since you were like five years old, is using your pace and your skills to beat people, hit the line, and cross that ball in. And if you're not doing it, it's either because you've totally forgotten how to do it, which is unlikely, or you're being told not to do it. Yeah. You're being told to be conservative. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reflect on one last thing on, on Pellegrino before we move on to potentially who, who the next Southampton manager could be. Um, maybe a dangerous game to play because they might appoint someone before we uh, finish right recording. Right and, uh, well, and they need to two. hurry up, really, <laughs> given it's late March. Um, but uh, when I met Pellegrino, he was... A nice guy. He was very philosophical. So I asked him some questions. He never really gave a straight answer. He was kind of a you know a thinking man. You know, lean back in the armchair, stroke the chin, and 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 spin some yarn about um, you know wh- whatever it was. And it, and he always says you know maybe things can happen like this. Maybe things can happen like that. W- was he just a kind of too nice, and maybe b too waffly? You know, football players need direction so you know um jones obviously had some very very clear directions from allardyce and and maybe the players didn't totally understand what they were supposed to be doing out there because it certainly didn't look like they were playing to any functional system you know pretty much any point this season i you you do hear that it's too nice like that was there's a good piece a brief piece but good piece in the independent today where someone uh said that you know he he when he joined he's like lovely guy but is he got the mean streak that you need and I don't know he always just came out after every game so you know we're learning it's mm. like man you're in the bottom three you need to stop <laughs> learning you start doing and I, I think yeah he was I think he was too he's too naive more probably rather than nice yeah I don't know I mean I, managers obviously need to make an impact whether that's through kind of you know your Ferguson style underlying threats or your kind of your Wenger ph- threats yeah sometimes. well yeah or yeah your, your Wenger philosophy or your kind of Martin O'Neill turn up for five minutes on a Saturday and an inspiration but that you kind of need some sort of like angle and he did he did sort of strike me as someone who he didn't really have anything in that sort of sense it was kind of just a bit vanilla yeah the, the only times he really did well were in a couple of the games against some of the bigger clubs. So we got that draw at Old Trafford. We didn't play too badly against Man United at home. Um, we were unlucky to lose away at Man City. Yeah, we, we, we were. And and so, and I think possibly that is why Saints appointed him because they saw his performance against Barcelona last season and thought, well, if he can mastermind that, then surely he can mastermind Burnley and Swansea as well. But you know, well, those he, ones have proved more tricky for us. He he just struck me as a man who it was almost like we'll stay up if we get enough draws, mm. uh, and and that like his whole philosophy is we'll just draw and it'll be fine. But maybe he still thought it was not. two points for a win in England. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> old school. But I you know, and I I think like he just he wasn't decisive enough at the moments that mattered, and I think you know he's he's paid the price for that with his enormous payoff for nine months' work. Um, so. Let's move on from Pellegrino. He's gone. Nice guy. Not really up to the job of a Premier League football manager as far as I, I can see. If you were the Saints board now, who would you appoint? You know, you've got eight Premier League games remaining. You've got quarterfinals of the FA Cup. There's there's a good potential to get, you know, through to the semi-final, potentially the final there. Who, who, who would you try and entice in? 
I'm going to pass that to Duncan. Hmm. Well, I think isn't the favourite Mark Hughes, which, you know, ex-player, um, which helps, I think. Although he was not great. <laughs> Saints is probably better. No, I think, he, I think, I can't remember the number, he recorded the first place to get, like, I think, sort of record yellow cards in a season, like 14 or something, which is genuinely impressive. He Maybe also did 15, an amazing thing where he scored a goal, he hit, but he hit the ball so hard, it this was obviously before technology, or before this, and it kind of hit the back of the thing and bounced. Oh out. yeah, I yeah, believe that. Yeah. Got an original yeah. ghost. It was so though, weird. Yeah, it? I think that was against Leeds, wasn't it? It was nil nil when he did it. It came out. Mm. The, the goal was disallowed. Well, they, and went on to lose three nil. Was that at the Dell with your? It was six tiny little ball yeah. goals. I mean, he kind of had it coming. It was like Sabutier goals. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was also when he was reinventing himself as a midfielder, which never happens anymore, really, apart from Rooney, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's, I think, boy, he's only won nine of his last 38 Premier League games, but two of those were against Southampton. So maybe <laughs> maybe he understands Southampton. I mean, maybe there's a motivation as well for Southampton to stay up at the expense of Stoke for, for him. Yeah, you know, I'm which, sure he's, yeah, uh, that rankles a bit. I think, you know, he did okay at Stoke for, yeah. for three seasons. Yeah. And then... You know, how long can you stay at stake? A bit of a philosophical question, but uh, it kind of seemed to run its course. I don't think he'd be, he'd be that bad. I mean, I guess, you know, Marco Silva as well is out of work. Um, you know, Almost kept Hull up in a similar situation. Yeah, obviously came in a little bit earlier, but yeah. he tends, if you look at Watford as well, did really well at the start. And obviously, from all accounts, the Everton thing was what destabilised yeah. that. But, you know, he seems to be someone that can come in and make a, an impact quite quickly. Um, and he also is fairly attacking. And, you know, I think a bit like when Carvajal went to Swansea this season, the squad's all right. You just need someone to come in with a philosophy and go, and, do you know what, you've been too defensive. You're better players than you've been made to look. Let's go and score some goals. And I think he would be quite good at that. I, I am quite surprised, actually, that Mark Hughes... Um from our in the no sources well Jeremy Wilson from the Telegraph he doesn't even know more about Saints than anyone yeah club, I mean he, to be fair. he seems to break all the big stories so he, he he told us that Mark Hughes was pretty much the number one target I'm actually surprised I would have thought Silva would have been a better target for eight eight games remaining I think you know whether it's Silva or Hughes both of them are going to be better than sticking with Pellegrino which, which clearly wasn't working but uh, I'm quite interested though if you could get anyone, who 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 would you get? You know, make, make, make it slightly realistic. But like, yeah. if if you were the board drawing up that that short list, who who would be the top of it for you? Uh, I I wouldn't go Silver because I think Silver will just leave Saints as soon as someone mm. flats their eyelash at him, and you'll just be Watford Mark Two. I don't think that would necessarily be a problem this season, though. If he could just keep no, no, but up, I think yeah. I think we I, I agree. Like we need to stay up, like yeah. first and foremost, and then we'll we'll look at you know we'll fight the next fight, but. I think realistically it's going to be one of Silver or Hughes. Everything you've read today in the press from like Benali and people coming out, it's Hughes. I'd be amazed if it was anyone but Hughes. I don't think it's the worst appointment. I think we have to think long term though. And I don't know if Hughes has the, uh, the reputation to take us to the level where certainly Saints fans think they should be at, where, whether the club thinks they should be at. Um, there was talk about us getting two shell from. Uh, Dortmund, I think, uh, you know, you, you're a big fan of Bielsa. Maybe they're just pipe dreams. Mm. I don't know, but Bielsa, who knows? A, you know, I mean, he's kind of the kind of pipe dream for so many people, for yeah. so many clubs. And often what happens is he comes into a club and everyone's very excited and then it all goes wrong. Yeah. But theoretically, he is a great choice. Um, but yeah. So my, my rationale behind Bielsa is, you know, the, the influence he's had on Pochettino, the influence he's had on Guardiola, you know, you, you can't ignore that. But looking at the formation that he likes to play, um, it is very, very attacking. It's very, very fast paced and it does involve pressing. And if you look at the two successful managers we've had recently, Pochettino and Koeman, have elements of Bielsa's philosophy. So I think the squad would be able to pick up what he'd want to do quite quickly. Although I, I do think he'd maybe be a risk coming in eight games at the end of the season. I think he'd almost be better off. Yeah, being a, he's a, a summer, summer appointment, appointment yeah. manager, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'd, who, who knows? I mean, I think we well, we think they'll probably end up with Hughes. I don't think it's the worst appointment. I think he'll, I think he'll grab some people and shake them about a bit, and maybe it's just what Saints need. I think one of the things we've spoken about a number of times, and it's not particularly original thought, is just we were sleepwalking towards relegation, almost like it wasn't going to happen to us, and. You heard noises from players like Ward Prowse saying, well, we're going to be okay. 
It's like it's yeah, not. We haven't seen any evidence. Yeah, like why? That. What's that based upon? Is that that's based on their belief as professionals that they're better than the next bunch. Well, I've got news for you. You know, stats. Three teams sta- go down. Yeah, three teams go down, and the stats say that you're probably going to be amongst them. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, let let us know who you would have as your your Saints manager, or what you think of the new guy once he's appointed. You know, b- between us finishing recording this and putting it out, um, email us saintsfcpodcast at gmail dot com or get in contact at saintsfcpodcast on Twitter. Um, Duncan, we're very very privileged to have you here today. So I th- I think we need to move on to stats, which is your your field of expertise. Um, this is really good because we just kind of guess at stuff. So this is actually a real someone who knows about yeah. things. Maybe I do as well. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who are watching on the Ugly Inside on YouTube, I'm holding up a copy of Duncan Alexander's book here. Um, this is called Outside the Box. It came out was it before Christmas uh, last year? Yeah, sort of autumn last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I planned on finishing it uh, last night, but then obviously we sat at Pellegrino, so I've still got about a quarter of the way to go, but absolutely thoroughly enjoying it. Um, Duncan, do you, let, let's do a really annoying interview question. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? And, uh, you know, I, I'm interested to find out how did you end up becoming a professional football statistician? Good question. There's not really a defined career path in that thing, I guess. I mean, ultimately... At the start, I kind of leveraged the knowledge I gleaned from when I used to read a lot of football magazines when I was a kid. All the times my mum used to say, stop reading those and do your homework. Like when Saturday comes and... Yeah, and, and 90, 90 minutes, minutes and yeah. shoot and stuff. And, you know, ultimately that knowledge kind of got me into the industry because I had to sort of show that I knew about football. Um, and then obviously I've hopefully developed from there. But yeah, I've been in been in the kind of industry for sort of 10, 12 years now. Um, and seeing it grow from a really kind of niche thing i mean you know to worked with sky with um all the major papers but we were fairly kind of under the radar and then i guess 2009 me and me and a colleague basically had seen twitter grow um or emerge and and realized that we were already producing content that was about 140 characters yeah. long and most of it wasn't used we'd you know we'd send maybe 80 facts to to clients and they'd use four or five so all these things, every week stuff would just and when you say clients who are they that'd be newspapers yeah or TV. newspapers tv um yeah mainly those uh and so thought well maybe that would fit and we had quite a lot of pushback actually at the start from commercial people saying oh this is not a good idea you're giving away free content but as it turned out our customers loved it because it you know ultimately most people want to do their job in the easiest way possible and if you can have a kind of you know list of stuff that's appearing during the day saying this happened or this player did this it's easy for them to sort of contact us and go i quite like that can you turn that into a into a list or whatever and and there's a, a few different facets of opta isn't there so there's like opta opta joe opta pro <laughs> as long as it rhymes yeah or, yeah uh opta snow that's our weather account <laughs> um yeah no so opta joe was our was our twitter that kind of I, that turned us from a kind of minor thing to a fairly well-known brand. Yeah. Uh, and then I think 2011, we launched Opta Pro, which was, we'd been working with clubs beforehand, but obviously we were quite unique in the sense that we were a media-facing thing, but we worked with football clubs. Mm. And they were obviously, for understandable reasons, a little bit reticent for us to, um, you know, be in the same, you know, if, if we were on the, if we were dealing with a football club who were looking at players and we were on the, on the phone to a tabloid, you know, there's potential for possible, you know, yeah. Chinese walls. Too. Exactly. So, so we kind of separated them out. Although there is a fair amount of you know, interaction, but uh, yeah, up to pro is our kind of club facing thing. Yeah. Is it, you do hear a lot about how football manager like and championship manager researchers end up supplying lots and lots of stats to clubs. But but do you guys? That, do you... Yeah, that's a bit of a misnomer, really. Yeah. I mean, I think that whole thing stemmed from. Um, they used i mean what football manager has very good is like a, you know players names and dates yeah. of birth and stuff which i think has been used by clubs as a kind of database essentially but i'm pretty sure no club's ever signed a player on the fact that he's got aggression 17 or <laughs> tommy spindle larson is the classic champ uh, championship manager player that was nothing but best player in the world according to those guys yeah oh yeah there's been quite a few of that um so so with 
so you're kind of mainly behind up to joe is, mm-hmm. is that right and then, and then yeah i mean we've kind of like a different arm of the business yeah i mean i kind of flip between all elements really yeah. but um yeah i mean up to joe and up to his kind of media side and then up to pros the, yeah. the pro side Cause it, i mean there's quite a lot of stuff that's been said about southampton and their like famous black box as it's called it in in their training ground where they analyze you know hundreds of different players and managers and they supposedly always have a plan mm. are the kind of people that are the kind of clubs approaching you are they kind of like lower down the pecking order or um you know do, do the big clubs do their own thing how, how does it work uh so we work with i think probably over 100 clubs worldwide and you know among those are some of the biggest biggest clubs in the world so <laughs> it, it what tends to be the difference is the amount of resource that a club has so mm. i mean we've worked with the likes of chelsea manchester city for a long time they have a lot of resource obviously they have big teams of, of analysts so they tend to just take a lot of data from us and kind of do what what they will you know okay. we, we don't really see that much although city are quite good at sharing stuff yeah um lower down if you're working with like a championship club or maybe a club in belgium or south america or something you know they don't have the resource to do all that research themselves so we have um people and applications that they can use and access to you know to hopefully do similar things yeah. but yeah so, so when it comes to the weekend, what what sort of things are you looking at? What what excites you when you go to to watch a match? Because it's kind of one thing. Once you're in it and you know stuff, it, it's like you know if you play a musical instrument, you go and watch a band, and you're mm. like always. Oh, I play the drum, so I always watch the drum, and I'm really interested in what. You yeah, no, I try and watch games in a really pure way sometimes, but I can't do it anymore. So I'm. I mean, I guess my own sort of spin-off brand that sounds awful but you know what i mean but like is it the kind of more obscure stuff or the i guess the more niche sort of way of looking at football and i just end up going down little wormholes all the time so you know i'll see a player um do something unusual or you know a team that's that's got a weird lineup or something and, and it, your mind just sort of goes off and the problem is that we've now i've got so many tools that allow me to research stuff that uh, that normal people wouldn't have that it's not like i can go oh well, that's impossible to work out it's like that's difficult to work out yeah. but i can work it out so i better <laughs> go and work it out um so i mean i think i set you a couple of little challenges before here, which we'll, which we'll yeah. get to later um do you, do you want to tell us about the book the Out, outside the box because you know I, i've been reading it i've been enjoying it but you can probably tell us a little bit more about the premise i mean it's looking at the 25 year anniversary of the premier league really yeah so i wrote a book the year before the the up to joe football yearbook also available from all good bookshops which was a kind of look at the 2015-16 season generally yeah um which was fortunate in the sense that it was a particularly you know memorable premier league season with leicester winning the league and blah 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 um and then uh, for this one um it was obviously the end of the 25th year so that kind of lent itself to um to looking at each season so it goes through that but i didn't want to limit myself to that so you know looked at kind of you know up to one of the criticisms we often face is you know people saying um you think football started in 1992 which we clearly don't, but the Premier League did start in 1992, so that's quite a nice cut-off point. And a lot of data only exists from 1992. You know, we, you know, you can say, oh, Eric Cantona got 17 assists this season in '94, whatever, and someone will go, well, what about this player in 1972? Like, if you want to go and research it and let us know, we'll gladly, you know, accept yeah. that. But the point is that you can't because all these games have just disappeared. Essentially. Yeah. Do you, on, on that note, do you think the the Premier League saw a uh, like a real step change in terms of like professionalization like this is not really a word but like how the professionalization of football almost like in terms of nutrition fitness stats mm. things like that yeah i mean i think the th- well, one of the big changes in football in the last 30 years is the back pass rule which came in exactly august 92 exactly the same time as the premier league started and you know that has changed football in a way that you know is massive you know the the idea of Edison. I mean, if Edison um, existed in the late eighties, he'd have been playing in midfield or up front. He wouldn't have been in goal. But now, you know, his skills with his feet are, are valuable in goal. Um, and similarly with nutrition, you know, Arsene Wenger came in at Arsenal, and just by telling his players not to drink 
before training and you know eat pasta <laughs> instead of chips they got this massive competitive advantage for a few years at least um i touched one of the chapters in the book actually is about the all the years liverpool have gone without winning the league um and it's kind of written in a, a kind of second uh tense sort of thing and and one of the points i i kind of realized as i researched it was that graeme suness although he was a pretty bad manager did make some absolutely terrible signings for liverpool he he did try and revolutionise them in a way that Wenger did with Arsenal, but he did it a few years earlier. And Liverpool had been successful a lot more recently, and their players were very much against, um, you know, those changes. So. If we're going to talk about Graham Sunes signings, think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's one, one yeah. there's one that's been to mind. Boom song, yeah. and the other guy, yeah, right, um, I was there, yeah, Ali Dear, I wow. was there, man. He clearly wasn't using uh, Opta Pro to get the stats on Ali no, Dia, was or, or he? any rudimentary no. database. Or <laughs> well, any da- even a database would no, have been yeah. uh, an upgrade. It's, it's, it's interesting to see a Timothy Ware breaking onto the scene. I wonder if he's got a cousin we can uh, we can uh, you know <laughs> yeah. get involved. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things when I was reading your book is that I actually really enjoyed the uh, the twenty seven years of Liverpool. I think that Saints fans have you know, a slightly <laughs> ill feeling towards Liverpool uh, yeah. uh, over the recent years. And it was very, very funny to kind of read that, read that chapter about, you know, each season going by and, oh yeah, you'll never catch us, you know, comments to, to Man United. And, but it, it, it's, I guess it's quite difficult with stats to try and make them come alive, but you've managed to do that in the book and actually make it kind of colloquial and fun at the yeah, same I mean, time. That's, that's the thing. I mean, I don't come from a statistical background at all, really. I mean, I, you know, did history at university and I'm, you know, I'm very much, uh, you know, I support Wickham. I've been to, I don't know, like 70 of the 92 grounds. I'm not some, you know, you always get things leveled at mm. about statisticians. They sit in air conditioned rooms and, and hate football, but just like numbers, that isn't really me, but I do enjoy kind of the debunking and the, and the, you know, shattering of myths and that stuff. But I think you, you can't just be that guy that's like actually that's not true or this you know you kind of have to make it entertaining and a, and a bit of fun and I think that's that's been the kind of success of up to Joe's that we don't it's not taken too seriously you know yeah. it's not like we know everything and you don't it's like you know here's some information you might like this you might not but it's there if you want it yeah and there's quite a few mentions of um Saints players in in the kind of uh, first chapter of quite uh, it's, it's almost like bizarre stats or kind of forgotten heroes of the Premier League or, or people who have achieved something statistically that, that's quite bizarre. Um, and, uh, you know, there's one of the ones like Franny Benali. I think you have statistical evidence that he is a lunatic. <laughs> yeah. So basically someone asked me on Twitter a couple of years ago if there were more red cards when there was a full moon. And I had an evening spare. And so I thought, <laughs> yeah, why not? I'll research this. And that involved me typing every full moon date from 1992 onwards, which takes quite a long time. Halfway through, I was like, why am I doing that? <laughs> um, anyway, did it. And luckily, <clears throat> it did show that there are more red cards when there's a full moon. And the first Premier League player to ever get sent off when there was a full moon was Franny Bernardi. That's great. We should ask him about that. Franny Bernardi. He looks like yeah. he might be affected by the moon. I don't know. Well, he, he looks like that in the way that he looks like he doesn't age. Mm. He's got some sort of mystical lunar power going yeah. on somewhere. Yeah. I saw him head by Eric Cantona. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you had quite a nice uh, stat, stat about Reddy Jaidi as well, who's the um, under-23 coach for mm. Southampton. He, he played for Saints and a few other Premier League sides. But, you know, you, you wouldn't... like. I guess the kind of highlight from your stat about him is almost he'd be the best player to ever go and watch because you're guaranteed something. And yeah, I think he's, got them, he's got them, it. I don't think, I know, he's got the most <laughs> appearances in the Premier League without a nil-nil. Yeah. I can't actually remember the number, but it's fairly high. Um, so, yeah. That doesn't reflect too well on his actual job. Which no, he's a defender, <laughs> defender, yeah. He's a defender, yeah. So, but, um, yeah, I mean, I love all that stuff. You know, it, there's a bit in the book about... Um, I, I thought, well, who's the player who's been born the furthest away from the Premier League to play in the Premier League? And I looked up, you know, what's the city furthest away from England? And it's, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, it's Dunedin or Dunedin in, in New Zealand. Um, and there's one player from there who's playing the Premier League, uh, which is Lee Norfolk. And he played for Ipswich. So he played all his games. He only ever played in home games. So he played all his games in Suffolk. <laughs> it's called Lee Norfolk. And he's... 
from the furthest point away from England on the planet. And it's like, I just, you know, I yeah. things like that. Um, one of the things which I also kind of uh, thoroughly enjoyed in the book was when you went over kind of the, the history of football stats. And, mm. and, you know, there were some stats before 1992 and some... Almost the the way you uh, you paint a chap called Charles Reap and this quite sinister character is is almost a is, is he a modern day Allardyce in in his approach uh, sorry a latter day Allardyce in in his approach to the game or because Allardyce likes to use stats but he uses it in a slightly different way. Doesn't yeah, he? I mean, I guess this. I mean, sort of philosophically, stats. It's not like a stats means there's, a, there's an approach. You know, you can use stats. To play like Manchester City, you can use them to play like Egil Olsen's Wimbledon. You know, it's, it, there's no kind of definitive thing. I mean, Charles Reap's an interesting character. He he was an RAF commander um, in the war, I think, um, and basically in the 1950s decided that football needed analysing and, and basically started going to games with a pen and paper and noting down, you know, stats. Um, you can't argue with his kind of commitment to it. You know, he was literally there. There was no replays or anything. But what he kind of did was jump to some fairly bad conclusions in the data. He, he basically worked out, he basically counted the number of passes before shots, which is fine. Um, but obviously most shots come from a, a few number of passes due to turnovers or a penalty or a corner that comes in. And he basically decided that because of that, that the, the, few, the, the smaller number of shots, uh, passes before a shot, that was the way to go. Um, and that basically influenced English football, probably even to now, really. We were only yeah. really kind of getting over is that, that. Is that. Is that kind of the long ball? Yeah, so he, he then had some acolytes. Um, Stan Cullis at Wolves used it to... It's not, it's not an impossible approach in the sense that, you know, you had Cambridge, you had Wimbledon that did use long ball football with some success. But at the top level passing the football moving the opponents around is more effective than just you know hit and hope um and yeah basically the fa in the 80s under a guy called charles hughes um adopted it as a kind of ethos and it i think it really did you know graham taylor was the kind of end product really and and we saw i mean my, one of my long held theories is that england squad in the 94 world cup would have was good enough to win the win the World Cup. Mm. You know, you think about it, Gascoigne in his prime, Ince, you know, Shearer, Fowler, McManaman, it was a good team. Yeah. It's, it's funny with Graham Taylor as well, is that people, Saints fans give Glenn Hoddle a lot of stick for not choosing Matt Letizia, but Letizia was pretty good in 1994, and I think, um, what's the name of the guy? Andy Sinton. I mean, he was yeah, playing in the, in the 1994 Wednesday, squad. You just think like, when you had players as talented and as yeah, brilliant as Matt Letizia at your disposal, you know. But I think with Hoddle, though, people thought Colton Palmer as well was Colton another Palmer player. Obviously, who, I think got more caps than May. Yeah, uh, but loads I think, more. I think with uh, I think with Hoddle though, I think because because Saints thought here's a kindred spirit, here's a man who understands because Hoddle never got the games, mm. yeah, you know, never really got the credit he deserved for being the player he was, and he never certainly, you know, he should have been first name on the England team sheet, and as I understand, he wasn't. And I think people probably thought. This is a chance, you know, this is his chance to say that England can thrive. Mm. We're not a team of cloggers. We can have a creative genius. And then he just went, yeah. <laughs> <Do one." laughs> thing like that. I think that's why Saints fans hate Hoddle. Yeah. It's almost because you, you, you wanted more from him. Yeah. Gone a little bit off, uh, off topic here. <laughs> um, w one of the things which uh, we mentioned earlier about uh, Arsene Wenger kind of bringing in the nutrition thing that giving um, Arsenal a bit of an advantage in the early years of the Premier League. I think kind of Southampton's scouting approach has probably gave them a bit of an advantage when we came up from the Championship in you know, in appointing Pochettino, appointing you know, players like Mane, um, you know, Graziano Pella. You know, we, we brought in some really good players which have now gone have now gone on to kind of bigger and better teams. So as much as it pains me to say, has have Southampton been caught up in terms of that kind of like analysis, that scouting, that, you know, use of, of statistics or, or did we just kind of strike it lucky with, with what the data we had? Yeah, I think it's so prevalent now. This like every team does it. Yeah. And it's the competitive advantage of like five years ago has gone in the sense that, you know, every, every team knows that you can probably find good players 
by expanding your scouting network, yeah. possibly using data. Um, you know, look at Leicester, look at, you know, Newcastle when uh, Graham Carr was signing. Mm. For, you know, there, there'll be periods where you kind of strike it lucky. Yeah. But you look at the way Steve Walsh went from Leicester when he was like a, a god among scouts to going to Everton and, and, you know, their transfer policy has been <laughs> wayward to say the least. So, yeah. you know, it, it's one of those things where stats is kind of an easy thing to point the finger at when it goes wrong. Um, what Southampton's done well, I think, is kind of, as things have gone well over the last half a decade, is to say, look, it's not just luck. We've got these systems, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But what that also does is alert other teams to say, oh, yeah, maybe we should be doing it's it. But they all are, well, really. Yeah. It's just, you know. Well, I wonder as well if um, with, with Saints, they... Uh, and this is like my job is is I do corporate PR, so I I, I feel I notice this stuff more. Saints were very vocal when everything was going well. Uh, you know, they were very like, let's invite people to Marchford, let's talk about all the cool stuff we have and how clever we are and how switched on and how we're two or three steps ahead of everyone else. And then as soon as it started to go a bit wrong, like they just turned that tap off. And I, I you do start to wonder then, well, how much of it was a bit of luck and how much was you know, a philosophy, which was let's buy players cheap. Let's hope they go. Let's hope they do brilliantly, which a number of them did like Van Dyke and Mane. And then, but sooner or later, you, you know, you burn through maybe mm. that, that sort of tier of player. And yeah. then you end up, what we, we've signed players that just aren't, aren't yeah, replacements. It, football is littered with examples of, of clubs kind of hanging on to a brief era. You know, you look at, the class of 92, which almost, you feel like saying TM after it now, because they've, you know, it's like the class of 92. But even, I remember going to Upton Park a couple of seasons ago, and like, everywhere you turned, it was 1966. Yeah. It was like, we won the World Cup. It's like, yeah. Three like, West Ham players yeah, in here, never, yeah. Know, just, you know, move on. That's gone. But, you know, clubs, football clubs are very kind of sentimental things at their heart, and it's, you can't blame them for doing it, but it is a bit over the top. Um, so I wonder when you were researching your book, did you come across any particularly interesting kind of Southampton statistical record holders or? Uh, possibly. Yeah. I mean, I had a look at some of the kind of uh, leaders in, uh, for Southampton in Premier yeah. League history. So I mean, obviously goals, you know, there's no prize for yeah. that one. But, um, and assists as well. Letitia is top with 64. But, you know, I thought I'd could test you guys a bit on the, on the oh other. God. So this after Letitia, it was 64 assists. Who's the next highest in the Premier League era for Southampton? I'd go Tadic. I'd go Tadic, yeah. That's yes, correct, with 27, yeah. which is Who, impressive. And also a much maligned, like he's a classic <laughs> player that after every Saints game, Saints fans will be like, he does nothing. <laughs> yeah. He does nothing, but he actually... That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Who's got the most yellow cards for Southampton? Oh, I, I'd be. I'd have to go Benali. Do you think? Yeah. I, mean, I, I might go. Um. I'll go the other side. I'll go Jason Dodd. They are the two obvious ones. He's actually Letitia as well. Is it forty nine? Wow. What, 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 what a hatchet, that's... man. Now that's why I wasn't picked for England. He was too violent. <laughs> it's a bit like my one of my favourite stats is um. The player who committed the most fouls at the 1970 World Cup was Pele. <laughs> no way. <laughs> that is good. Mind you, I mean, the best strikers are pretty dirty. Well, look I at Maratta this season. Yeah. Well, basically... who you spoke, I can't remember who defended it was. Someone was interviewed and they said, who's the nastiest player you've said again? They said Ricky Lambert. Ricky Lambert, like, punched, like, would just punch and elbow you and stamp, like, all the time. Yeah. Just, I can't. It was someone like Company, someone who like really, really good. Yeah. Like, who's the worst player? Like Ricky Lambert just will beat you up. Yeah, anyone that's come through sort of the lower leagues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Alan Shearer was always good for a you know good bit of fouling, and and I just remember you know Rude Van Nistelrooy. As soon as the cameras were off him or the play was away from him, he was always bullying the central Proper defenders. Snide, always, yeah. Sort of, yeah, elbows and yeah. stamps yeah, and stamps all sorts. And little niggly things. Yeah. 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 Okay. Last two in this context. Best win percentage. You can have two. You can have a player with at least 38 games because you can't... Obviously, okay. some players play one and win one. So, at least 38 games and then at least 80 games. So you're looking for two names. This is good. <sighs> this is great content. Yeah. <laughs> so, should we have a think about that and then come yeah. come back yeah. at the so, end? So, we're looking at a full reveal. season and then kind of two seasons. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one player is technically... Still a Southampton player, and one player has moved on. Okay, 
So have a think. Technically. I'm going to make a note. Let's just remember to find out the answer of this. Um, and then I guess the other thing, so Hampton have proved particularly adept at in the Premier League era, mainly thanks to Letizia and Lambert, is penalties. Um, yeah. So of all teams to take uh, at least 50 penalties, you've got by far the best conversion rate. That's great. Did 62 I, out of 69, which is decent. 62 out of 69. What yeah. of all Southampton's Premier League penalties? Yeah, I think right. four of them probably missed by Tannock. Got to be three, Miss Vitalik at least. Do you, do you have the? I haven't got Army Bay. Oh. He was up there. Yeah. yeah I yeah. mean the old. I mean Swansea. I think have scored twenty out of twenty one, but that's a you know. Yeah. But yeah. Because Matt Letizia had one saved. I don't think Crossley Ricky Lambert ever that. had a penalty saved. Not even for, time for Saints. Not in the no, not, not for yeah. Saints. Uh, yeah. Matty had one saved against Crossley, and then yeah. scored a ridiculous goal in the same game. Yeah. Like thirty five yards yeah. out of turning volley. We actually took a goal off Letizia, and he doesn't. I think he doesn't like Opta because of that. Because um, we were going back through some of the goals in the nineties, and there was one where he kind of crossed it in, and he it, it wouldn't basically it wouldn't be given as a goal now. So we kind of, but it, was, it put was, him down was, from a hundred. Was that the one at Selhurst Park from the corner? Possibly, Selhurst yeah. Park. Yeah, yeah. That was a, He um. That was an own goal. He went <laughs> down from a hundred and one to a hundred. If it gone from a hundred to ninety nine, I'd have. Yeah, but but you guys are, are are you guys are you like the arbiter of the number of goals scored? Like who does that rest so, with? Yeah, who, who does the dodgy goals panel, or do you just record the or, result? Or, or is that just like your? Panel? So your we are view? the official data suppliers to the Premier League, right? Um, although the Jeebus goals panel, I think the correct term for it now is the goal accreditation panel. It's much but, nicer. Yeah, it doesn't have the word dubious in it. Um, they don't meet anymore, and they used to kind of meet up on a I don't know. I imagine a probably a Monday evening, a, you know. an oak panelled pub <laughs> yeah. to discuss these things. Pints are best, yeah. Sandwiches, but now it's all decided on the day. I think mainly because of you know mm. fancy football players and stuff. Um, so yeah, we we do hear from the. So if there's a you know a contentious goal on a Saturday afternoon, we will give it as we see fit. But then they might decide, no, actually it's an own goal or actually mm. it's blah, blah, blah. So then, you know, but it's all done on the day now. So technology is the future. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. I think Jason Dodd's corner that he scored against Pompey was yeah. taken away from him as well. Well, you you had um, Ostenstad as well. His hat-trick, isn't it? Yeah. We, we... No, what, the Man United hat-trick? I, I, this I, is like learning that... I don't, I don't think anyone in Southampton accepts that. Right, so we... When I'm David... to think of the goals... So the, one of them was given to Phil Neville as an own goal by the oh, by the Jews Phil, goes Phil back a long time that. ago. He doesn't need that, no. But we once tweeted that Austin Sad didn't have a hat trick against Manchester United. It was when Dirk Coy or Bentley or someone had scored a hat trick, and we listed the ones and had yeah. loads of Southampton fans going, "You've forgotten Austin Sad." And we were like, "No, actually, it, one of these was." I think was I might Neville. have been one of the tweets. Yeah, well. possibly. <laughs> um, and in a delightful twist, uh, Austin Sad tweeted us with a picture of the match ball and said, you can take away my goal, but you can't take away my goal. <laughs> hey, good one, Ego. And he also loves the Smiths, which I respect. So yeah, He's a rocker. He's a, yeah. he's a big muse. Yeah. I'm tempted to give him the goal back, but I can't. <laughs> um, I was going to say, but there's a great um, Smiths cover that came up in my Spotify Discover Weekly playlist by Schneider TM. And uh, it's, Never heard of it. I'll, I'll show you guys later. I'll, I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes for for everyone who wants wants to hear it for the going down the the Smiths rabbit hole. Um, Say so Southampton stats. I mean, you mentioned to me, Duncan, when we were arranging to meet up, that Southampton had been a bit of a outlier this season. Well, yeah, just in terms of, I mean, we sort of touched on it a bit earlier. Just the XG, really. I mean. Yeah. You know, you're creating reasonably good chances. You're just not scoring them. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of been a, an issue over the last couple of seasons, really. If you look at um, the biggest gap between XG and actual goals yeah. uh, over the last two seasons, the the bottom nine teams, i.e. the ones that are doing worse, yeah. given the, the chances they've had, the only team that's in there twice is Southampton this season and last season. So, I mean... Th- you can look at that two ways. You can either say on the plus side, you're a good team. You just need some luck slash better finishing or <laughs> the, the the negative way of looking at it is there's something amiss and yeah. that you're going to spiral into the championship. So <laughs> pick, your, pick your scenario. I'll pick the first one. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess that's interesting. You know, you look at Shane Long getting all those goals under Kuman, and then you know he's had like what, one goal this season. And yeah, uh, I mean, your only striker that's really kind of performed this season has been Charlie Austin, yeah. but you can't really he's, rely. He's hardly on him. had any any game time. No, well, he's he's not played since Huddersfield, and and he doesn't. Yeah, he never had a full season in him. No. And to go into a full season of Premier League football relying on a bloke who's probably never, you know, since you know played a full season of football is kind of insane. <laughs> um, so that, can you just explain to Tom what XG is? Okay. I know what it is. Yeah. Well, right. I just some people listening might not, or, or yeah, might have on. the wrong idea because the one some people kind of think because of the name, which is possibly fair enough, that it that it um, is a predictive thing. So it's almost you know, that you're looking to the future when all it is is essentially a, a rating of chance quality. So we've obviously got hundreds of thousands of shots in our database from various points on the pitch. So if someone has a shot from, let's say, you know, 10 yards out to the left of goal, we can compare that shot with all the other shots from that exact same position with other things like, with, you know, set piece type. So does, and, that, does that measure like presence of defenders? For example, currently it doesn't the model because we don't have that data in in the model, but it's something yep. that that could be added. I mean, we're always tweaking it. It doesn't. Again, it, it's not just about position as well. It's about game state. It's about um, you know, obviously, if it's a header, that's harder to score than with your feet. If it's a corner, you assume that you know the, the penalty area is more crowded and mm. stuff like that. So it takes into account all these things. It basically says you had say a 22 percent chance of scoring based on the history of everyone that's ever had a shot there and this is basically your uh rate you know your quality against that so you, what you find is players like messi consistently are above the xg presumably because they're very good at football <laughs> i'm fairly confident in saying messi's quite good at football. <laughs> um the flips the, the and conversely you have players who are getting into good positions but just aren't finishing and you know, again, <laughs> yeah what you don't it also throws up is players that that might have one season when they're particularly good and and that's where it's useful for clubs in recruitment because it's you know you might look at the the raw data and say this player's got 20 goals but if his xg was 14 you're like well that seems a bit unsustainable you know the average player would have only scored 14 he's scored yeah. 20 he might be amazing he might be the new messi or it might have just been. You he know, might have had great wingers, or you it, know, he might have. Or as yeah. I like to call it, he might have had the Jamie Vardy eleven games in a row yeah. scenario, where yeah. basically everything you hit goes in. And, yeah. So, so in that way, does XG almost tell you? So we were talking about Burnley earlier, how you know, you'd expect them to score far fewer goals, and you'd expect them to concede much more. Does that tell you that the Burnley strikers and the Burnley goalkeeper are better than average, and the fact that Southampton have higher? XG and they have actual goal score tells you that, that the Southampton strikers are, are worse than average. I don't think you can make judgments like worse yeah. or better. It's just, it's more effective at this yeah. time. Now, okay. and that's what, you know, again, it's our kind of ethos in a sense that data is never going to replace the human eye. You know, yeah. the, it, all it does is, is give you a little bit more information, gives you a little bit more context. Okay. Um, maybe... You know, there's there's reasons that Burnley are doing well and Southampton aren't. Yeah, the XT hints at why that might be. It doesn't explain why that might be. Because Pellegrino spoke a number of times about efficiency. Mm. Towards the end, he kept speaking about efficiency, and it almost sounds like it's about that. In a, in a in a world where every team is pretty damn good, and chances, good chances of maybe few and far between, and goalkeepers are particularly good. You need it's that is the difference. It's the it's just the ability, just to like you say with Messi. Mm gets a chance he scores it's just about that efficiency yeah I mean I, a good one with Southampton actually was um, uh, remember a couple of seasons ago you drew nil nil at Arsenal and basically Arsenal had, it battered us yeah that's Fraser Forster yeah greatest performance from a goalkeeper so, I've seen until this season that was the biggest gap between goals and XG yeah. in a single Premier League game Arsenal basically 3.4 scored 0 this season Arsenal have beaten that with their Defeat to Manchester United when De Gea yeah, made. Yeah. So basically, Arsenal. Yeah, it's kind of it's good because it kind of feeds into Arsenal fans' paranoia about their yeah. team. You know, like oh, we're rubbish, but we're good, sort yeah. of thing. But the point is that you know that was in a period when Southampton stuff was going for you. You know, there's this intangible thing in football which is yeah. luck, and the data just kind of hints at that, really. You know, um, some of our listeners have sent in some questions via mm. Twitter. I'm going to pick out a couple of those. Um, 
uh, James Benny is my brother. He's, he's been on the podcast before. He wants to know what stats differentiate the hard workers um, you know, versus the creative players that you might pick in your fantasy team. So Tadic would be a good example of someone who you pick in your fantasy team because he gets all the assists. Yeah. But maybe someone like Hoiberg or Romeo at Southampton, who's a hard worker, or, or Kante would be mm. a good example of someone who is amazing on the pitch, but but not great in terms of your, your fantasy football kind of scores. Yeah, I mean, part of me likes fantasy football because it kind of introduced people to things like assists. Mm. You know, it was a kind of, you know, it did make a, a difference in sort of stat acceptance, if you yeah. like. But but part of the negative of it is it does make people concentrate on very attacking things. Yeah. Um, it is more difficult to highlight those players, but, you know, you look at Kante, he had the most uh, interceptions, most tackles at Leicester. Um, I think he repeated it at Chelsea in his yeah. first season. He had the same when he was in France as well. So yeah. you can kind of pick those players out. What we're trying to do at the moment is is link events. So we've obviously recorded events you know, single events, tackles, passes, shots, whatever. Um, we're now linking them into sequences. So that's, you know, we've got new models, essentially. So you can pick out players. They might not have the assist or the goal, but yeah. they might be involved in every kind of positive is that, move. Is that like a Dembele type player? That, exactly. Like where, yeah. like, you know, he's not an Ericsson, he's not a Son, he's not a Kane, but like he is, when you watch Spurs, he's like the beating heart of that mm. team. Yeah. So there's players where you kind of see a team's win percentage with them in and without them. And you can you see that they make a big effect, but until now it's been harder to find out. So what, what that was. So now, you know, we do, we are kind of developing ways to, to pull that out, you know, and it, that obviously has a big application in terms of player recruitment as well, because that's a more intangible thing to decide on. So. It's like Stephen Davis for Saints, for Saints isn't mm. it? Like Saints fans love Stephen Davis because he doesn't score many goals. He doesn't get loads of assists, but he's just such a tidy, yeah. neat player that kind of seems to bring things together. Yeah, every club's got players who the fans just know that when they're in the team, the team plays better. They, they might not be something they can put their finger on and go, look, he's scored 25 goals, yeah. but he's done something. That's Stephen Davis. Um, so it's so another one that, What's the difference um, statistically between the way kind of last season Southampton performed versus this season? Is there anything that really stands out? Not, I had a look at this earlier, not massively really. Mm. I mean, it's a bit like you were saying earlier, how the end of last season bled into this season. Yeah. And it, I mean, the things that didn't work for you last season have continued, continued to but yeah. a little bit worse. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are there any... Uh, I don't know if you like any Saints players who are noticeably because we like we've rallied against like Forster this season. I mean, Forster this season. I mean, he started to fade a bit last year, but I think uh, conversely to the likes of Tom Pope and De Gea, he's actually let in four more goals than you'd expect than you know the yeah. average base on XG. So he is in a bit of a, a bit of a slump. Yeah. Um, Muckers Red Saint seventy six says, "What's the one statistic that has most?" Surprised you in your career, so you're gonna look back at your whole <laughs> career. And think, Just a little, this was the Matrix. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's quite a few. I mean, one I did the other week, which a few people refused to accept, which I think we mentioned earlier, was basically looked at what a deemed classic lineup yeah. in the Premier I love League. This. this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I started off with um, the early Manchester United. I think no, actually, the, the stat was that the most used lineup in the Premier League was a yeah. really early Manchester United team, yeah. like McClare and Hughes and and uh, Giggs and stuff. But and so a lot of people said, "What? What about this team?" Um, and then I started going through some classic lineups, and it was you know the the sort of classic treble winning team for United, which was obviously Schmeichel, Gary Neville, Irwin, Johnson, Stam, Giggs. Um, Beckham, Keane, Scholes, Dw- uh, York and Cole only ever started two Premier League games together and I had Manchester United fans saying that that's, that can't be true I mean I, <laughs> I remember watching them week in week out and they were going to games again they played oh no they didn't and I went through and there was the, the classic Arsenal um, Invincibles team yeah. two games it, what I worked out was that basically a lot of these teams played in really memorable matches yeah. it's almost like that sears into the memory of fans and they kind of then think back to that general era and go, yeah, they were playing every week, but it really isn't. Because I guess every, like, every Arsenal fan thinks it was Petit and Vieira, but sometimes like Laurent. Well, you yeah, know, players like that. that you'd have really Parler come in, yeah, or yeah. you'd have, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
I've got one listener who always tweets in ridiculous uh, questions for when we're interviewing ex-players. And um, this really has nothing to do with football, but it's maybe <laughs> statistical based. I, I don't know if you just want to make up an answer to this one, but um, St. Bannerman uh, wants to know, um, are there more humans in the world or more road cones? Good question. I'm particularly enamored with uh, the short-lived... John Major venture the Cones Hotline in the early nineties. So uh, that was that's a throwback there. I don't know yeah, that. please. Yeah, I mean me. it, it sort of summed up the world in the nineties where all people were concerned about was the number of cones on motorways. So they had, had to set a up a line. With, yeah, if you had a problem with either the number of road cones or you thought there weren't enough, there was a number you could phone and they would put more road cones or take some away. If you felt like yeah, too many. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm gonna do you think St. Bannerman was on John Major's uh, team that came up Possibly, with this idea? Yeah. A, it could be John Major. He's yeah. a disillusioned civil servant who's sickened at the, at the decline of the cones. So, I mean, I'm going to say uh, human, surely. There's got to be, hasn't there? Yeah. It's like 7.6 billion humans on the planet. I hope so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can pirates play football? That comes from our friend at the Limehouse podcast. Well, Bristol so. Rovers can't. So. <laughs> I used to watch Bristol Rovers a lot. He grew up in Bath. Um, and uh, uh, are you invincible in the football game championship manager and are you good at fantasy football? I mean, those are two of the probably the most obvious mm, questions. I don't really play much you. fantasy football because the last thing I want to do on a Friday night is look at <laughs> potential lineups and, and stats um, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I... I wasn't that great. No. I was good at sensible soccer. Yeah. I had a 72 game unbeaten run, which I'm hanging on to. <laughs> it ended as everything does. That's a, that's a proper blast from the past, isn't it? Sensible soccer. Um, so, should we go back to your questions and the, the big reveal? Yeah. So 38 and... So I'll give you the numbers because uh, that might help. So, so you first get home, can, player, can you repeat the question? So the question just, is... Uh, my, my memory's like a sieve. These are the best win percentages yeah. for Southampton in the Premier League. So for a player, for a player with at least 38 games, there's yeah. a kind of generic cutoff. We're looking, he won 22 out of exactly 38. And then we're looking, if we're looking for a, some, you know, a more ex, uh, regular player, um, someone won 39 out of 85. All right, so 22 out of 38, best team we had in the Premier League was Cummins, Cummins yeah. sixth place team. Uh, I'm going to go Sadio Mane. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good shout. And then for the, the longer, I want to throw in Chris Marsden, just hmm. for the, for the longer. I think you're one. an optimist. Yeah, there. well, so... I mean, it, funnily enough, looking at the manager stats, which I have been over the last couple of days, they they had you know Kuman, Pochettino, Strachan were all up towards the top of the win percentage charts. I think so was Paul Sturrock, which was quite bizarre, but um, okay. yeah, he didn't manage thirty eight. <laughs> Sadio Mane is a good shout. Um, on the so Sadio, so would you go Sadio Mane on the? Do you want to chuck a, a, an alternative? I'm, I'm going to show. I'm going to throw Adam Lallana in there. Okay. Yeah. And um, I'm going to throw it Chris Marsden just for a laugh. For the bigger stat. Yeah. I respect uh, the, the choice of Chris for, Marsden just because I just he wanted was to an underrated him. player. Yeah. He scored a great Pele S goal, didn't he? Yeah. Six player. I would go, so I would go Sadio Mane for 38 games and for 80 games, I would say, um, oh my God. I, oh, Christ. Uh, I'll give you, yeah. he scored a very good goal this season. Oh, this season? Mm -hmm. Not for Southampton, but it was in the Premier League. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, oh, I can't. I can't even think. Shall I? Shall I? Yeah, yeah go on. Put us out on. Okay, so the guy with the best record, which is fifty-eight percent, so twenty-two out of thirty-eight, is uh, is Geordie Classy. No way. No. <laughs> of all the things we've been saying, <laughs> recall him. Recall Harrison him. Reed, who? <laughs> And then the guy with... That's amazing. 46%, 39 wins from 85, Victor Wanyama. Yeah. Which sort of, that kind bruiser. of, that, that seems yeah. fine. Yeah, because yeah, he was kind of the uh, the heart of everything that was kind of yeah. good. Yeah, like Saints and it's gone on time. to be a very good player for Tottenham. Yeah, yeah. So. And yeah. he's got a very, as you say, a yeah. rocket of a goal this season. Jordi Classy. Who'd have thought it? Who'd have thought he'd even been in 22 winning teams? <laughs> 
That, I mean, that has just literally blown my mind <laughs> wide go. apart. Go, you know what they go show? They go show that football fans know nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely like, nothing. Absolutely nothing about football. And Incl- including ourselves. Is, is this the last podcast we're doing, Tom? I think you just, <laughs> just bur- killed it. Burn the house down and move to the boondocks. Yeah. Um, Duncan, I, I know you had a few um, notes with you. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that, that you, you did some research on that, that you'd like to, to get out? You've been susceptible to long range girls, which sort of Yeah, Fraser Forster. This is my my point about Forster, which is he's too big. It's not an original Can't thought, move. but I I think he came out from injury. I mean he was a giant anyway, and he, he now he looks like uh, he's Mike up Johnson, well, isn't he? Yeah. Just too big, and I think you shoot low and hard against him and he can't get down. Yeah. Compared to like, a lot of good goalkeepers now that are quite wiry, like De Gea and mm. um Courtois that are quite kind of spindly almost. Mm. That's my view. Yeah, it's a good shout. But yeah, that's about it, really. I mean we can <laughs> go wherever really um, well I, th- I think we've uh, we've probably done enough on that I mean I don't know if we've appointed a new manager yet uh, possibly not That's I mean it's I quite see. quite late in the evening now um, Duncan thank you very very much for, yeah, for really coming on, onto the show I mean that no, thanks for having me yeah I don't think Duncan, anyone's, anyone's blown our minds like that at no. the end with that Yordi Classy stat I mean, <laughs> we know nothing yeah. and get get Duncan's book yeah so um, £13.27 at Amazon well, obviously, I'm heavily biased, but other <laughs> it's available at other bookstores. Um, funny okay. enough, I did go to my local Waterstones. They didn't have it there, so I actually had to go to Amazon. But, you know, there, yes. there we go. Uh, Outside the Box by Duncan Alexander. Brilliant read. Um, I'd thoroughly recommend it. If you're interested in football... Which, you if know, you're not, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not... Yeah, then and, it's, and, and if you've read it this no. far to the end of the episode... <laughs> yeah, it's a bold man. Really um, but yeah, thank you very much for, for coming. If people want to find out more about you, see stats coming out, where, where should they head, Duncan? You can either go to up to Joe, which I'm guessing most people listening to this would have heard of. Um, I'm on Twitter as well, which is uh, Oily Sailor. Yeah. Which is a, what's yeah. the... What's the uh, basically... Genesis of that? It, yeah, basically, uh, it was a name I chose on a Wickham message board in the late 90s for no <laughs> reason. Good. Which basically i've had to stick with because i've got quite a common name and and the, there's a welsh actor called duncan alexander and i can't get the name of him on Twitter. Yeah. So seo fine. yeah um yeah so brilliant thank you very much for, for having us on uh if you want to send in your thoughts about the episode please email saints fc podcast at, at gmail.com head to at saints fc podcast at twitter um if you fancy going to see matt Letizia chatting at revolution in southampton that is next thursday the 22nd get down there um you know i'll have to Maybe I'll, I'll see if I can find some obscure stats to ask Matt Letizia uh, about as well in that. Ask him about the goal that's been taken off and see how he feels. Oh, yeah, that, that, that would be a good one. I, I don't want to wind him up there. I want, <laughs> I want Matt Letizia to be a good and long friend of the podcast. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's all from us. Um, so bye-bye from me. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>